our generation is, is very informed, very skeptical of, of corporate and legacy media. And I think just generally trust in, in corporate media is, is at all time lows, which is a good thing. It's something to celebrate because they are not trustworthy. They spread propaganda. That's their job. Uh, you succeed in corporate media by lying shamelessly. Uh, so it, it's a good thing that no one's listening to that. And I think there's uh, a recognition among people who are my age that uh, what they hear on CNN or Fox News or MSNBC uh, is not true or what they read in the New York Times uh, or the Washington Post is, is omitting uh, key details of, of real events in the real world. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking to a young colleague. I've got with me Harrison Berger. Um, Harry holds a degree in Russian and Eastern European Studies and has been working for Glenn Greenwald's System Update for the past two years. Harry just recently decided to uh, do his own show and is now going to build up his, um, his own uh, media operation and we will cooperate on this channel. I, I will be broadcasting a couple of his shows, which he's already producing at the moment. And to introduce him, we want to talk. So Harry, welcome. Pascal, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm a big fan of your channel and you guys do very important work. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just thrilled to, to be a part of this. Well, thank you very much for, for uh, reaching out because you said you're going to produce your own um, shows. I mean, your own interviews, actually. And you're already, we've got one waiting just until this interview is out, which is going to with uh, going to be with Professor Ivan Kachanovsky, who's also been on this channel. And you are also going to, uh, to talk to these people now. Um, I just would like to introduce you a little bit. And you are also have a discussion with you about your demographic because you're you're very young you were born in 2001 i understand yeah exactly i was born in uh, in may of 2001 so um tell us a little bit more about yourself and i mean the the things you would like people to know also about how it came that you started working with uh, glenn greenwald and what you have learned over the past couple of years and you you're you're just also out of university right i mean as in two or three years ago so uh It's true. Um, so it was really just a dream come true to to work with Glenn because uh, I, I think he's one of the last real journalists. He's someone that I've always admired since I was a kid. Um, he was writing about issues like uh, the war on terror, the uh, surveillance abuses by our government, all the torture that we were doing abroad. And just generally, the he had a very, and it always has still today, a, a very critical eye uh, about the way that the United States engages abroad and the propaganda from mainly corporate media, but which comes from parts of the U.S. government and, and, and Western government sources uh, that spread, that the propaganda that spread by them uh, to kind of conceal our, our role abroad. And, and he's always been uh, one of those journalists and people like Noam Chomsky from that sort of tradition uh, who... who who takes that on and I've always respected that. And I, I, I think really he does it best. So he is, he is doing an amazing job. I mean, system update is a, is a, is a pearl and especially in the way that he approaches um, reporting on the important things that are going on and how he's able to produce that show. But um, you yourself then us, uh, you're, you went to university when, when did it happen to you that you kind of realized that um, a lot of the standard narratives that are out there, not just in the media, but also in, in quite a bit of the textbooks, right? And it's not it's not necessarily lies. It's just the way of the framing in which like in which we perceive world politics happening, and let's say the end of the Cold War as this moment of great liber, uh, liberalization, and finally, finally, uh, liberal democracy is going to reign supreme, and we're all going to be happy until the end of uh, of times. Um, when did you realize that there's something odd about that? Um, well, yeah, it's, it's as you say, it's not necessarily that they're just straight up lying, which they do all the time. Um, and on System Update, we revealed that a lot. Um, it's probably the best show to watch to to, to show all those lies and, and, and who they are, um, the people who spread them the most, the, the real disinformation agents. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I'd say I, I was... 
very aware, like at a young age, of all the lies in, in the war on terror. You know, the, the, the idea that, that there are no weapons of mass destruction. I, I come from like a liberal family, and that's, uh, you know, one of those things that everyone talks about all the time. Oh, Saddam Hussein never had weapons of mass destruction. George W. Bush and the neocons lied us into that war. That's just the kind of wisdom that uh, I grew up with. And the more I looked into it, uh, just the more horrifying everything was because it wasn't just that conflict. It was many others. It was Libya afterward and then Syria, the regime change war we tried to do there in secret for many years. Uh, and then ultimately uh, the lies around Russiagate, which culminated in our uh, more hawkish stance toward Russia, leading to uh, this current confrontation. So the, there were a lot of, of lies that I just saw in real time. Uh, and just the attempts to conceal the truth that are going on constantly, you know, even in 2024, especially around the war in Gaza that we are supporting uh, and, and the Ukraine war mainly. So um, I, I am quite interested in this also, like just regarding your demographics, because, you know, one of the things about this channel here, neutrality studies is, and I will superimpose the picture of this over, over, over here, that uh, we have 35.8% of the viewership of neutrality studies is 65 plus. Um, and the demographic 55 to 64 is like 24%. So uh, see around 60% of the roughly 60% of people viewing this are 50 or above. And the, the your, your demographic 18 to 24 is like 1.5%. There's like no, I mean, very, very few young people watch this show and i guess also like glenn greenwald is probably is has has has, has similar things and this then leads me to believe that the younger generation is less politically interested or 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 is less critical but i think that might be a misperception because you you guys are just in different different uh uh, media can you can you ta tell us a little bit about your impression of the of this of your generation and 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 your political um, um, mo motivations or or, or um, politicization in general I mean I don't know I mean I, I don't know if there's a, a lack of dissidence in our uh, generation I think uh, our generation is, is very informed very skeptical of of corporate and legacy media and I think just generally trust in in corporate media is is at all-time lows which is a good thing it's something to celebrate because they are not trustworthy they spread propaganda that's their job uh you succeed in corporate media by lying shamelessly uh so it, it's a good thing that no one's listening to that and i think there's uh, a recognition among people who are my age that uh, what they hear on CNN or Fox News or MSNBC uh, is not true, or what they read in the New York Times uh, or the Washington Post is is omitting uh, key details of of real events in the real world. So, I, I think there is that awareness among people my age. To in response to your question about why people aren't engaging with certain media, I'm not sure. I mean, I think on TikTok and, and Instagram, there's there's a lot of engagement. In fact. They want to suppress it. There, there's been intense efforts, for instance, by the Israeli government to censor uh, on meta platforms and on TikTok since October 7th. Uh, an incident that comes to mind is when TikTok banned the Osama bin Laden letter, which had gone viral in November of, of 2023, about a month after Israel's invasion. And people were asking the question, well, why did Osama bin Laden uh, attack the United States? They want people my age wanted to learn why. And I was, you know, less than a year old when this happened. And so I was curious about this too. And anyone can go on the Guardian website and find Bin Laden's letter to America and, and read about his motivations. We were told, of course, that he attacked us for our freedoms. That's why, uh, you know, 9-11 happened. And if you read this letter, he, he, he names all the, all the things, all the reasons why he attacked us because we were uh, propping up despotic regimes in that part of the world because we were supporting Israel, uh, who were crushing the Palestinians and destroying any chance of a peace deal. And uh, because we had our military bases, there were, there were many reasons. None of them had to do with, with freedom in, in the United States. Uh, that was not why they attacked us. And if you read this, you would find this out. And so TikTok very quickly banned 
this hashtag so that no one could read this. And the Guardian actually removed it from their site. Glenn and covered this a lot on, on system update and, and constantly talks about it but it's a very revealing event um because it just shows that they don't want people in my generation to know what what is actually going on the reasons why we're uh, you know we're hated in many parts of the world why people want to for instance work more with china that sort of thing the uh, how do you explain to yourself that this is happening you know the, one of the problems we have when we discuss um these kind of events is that we often need to uh retreat into using the pronoun they you know um but they then is is kind of is we need to explain how how it comes along that in societies which are not centrally controlled right and ni neither the us nor the uk europe i mean they're not there's not a central decision making authority and kind of a, a five six people in a in a dark room like sitting around a table and then like doing the puppeteering it's this is a social phenomenon um when you talk to your peers and people who went to to university with you how do you make sense out of the fact that we do have this media and propaganda environment but um, but it it happens in a decentralized way. That's that's just it's just not the same as how the the Soviet Union worked. It's not the same how like let's say propaganda in China works. I mean, yeah, that's that's completely true. But you know, obviously, no, Noam Chomsky uh, wrote about this in Manufacturing Consent. It's that there's uh, incentives in in corporate media to say certain things and. I mean, I, I wouldn't get hired at, at any of these uh, places like CBS News or NBC. I wouldn't fit in there uh, because I, I have views and opinions that go against and, and ask questions about these sort of foreign policy questions that people really don't want you to ask. Um, and so I guess when people say they, they're talking about uh, people who are self-motivated in corporate media who are saying things to get promoted and 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 really rise and and really the, the easiest way to to rise in corporate media is to lie uh, on behalf of of powerful people so there's there's many days uh there's you know those three letter agencies which are very powerful and which openly admit in their internal emails for instance like there's a famous line in the 2014 torture report to congress about how cia officers admit uh, amongst themselves that they just feed disinformation to the press who gobble it up they say every time you see se senior official written uh you know in a reuters article it's coming from us uh the the office of, of public uh relations or whatever it was called at the cia and so they they admit casually to, to doing this and spreading disinformation and uh you know these corporate media uh journalists if you can call them that just just kind of gobble up that propaganda, chew it up and, and spit it out to the public. Uh, but fortunately now, people are very aware uh, because of a number of incidents uh, that they've gotten completely wrong and everyone has seen them get wrong, uh, that people are more aware that what they're being told is is likely not true or, or not the complete story. Um, I, I'm curious about your opinion on this one. Um, there, you know, journalism and academia um, both in some way try to foster understanding and knowledge in different ways right on, on different on different subjects but there's one key difference that I've that I've noticed for a long time which is that in academics you are you need to prove everything you say with a source and the source needs to be open and accessible I mean open and accessible I mean you need to say like where do you get it from so every every thing that you claim, especially the important ones, there's not just dictionary knowledge, but, you know, uh, kind of important pieces of your arguments, they need to be backed up. And uh, in the natural sciences, of course, you have to run experiments and show how you did them so people could repeat them. Uh, in social science and in history, you just give the sources. In, in journalism, um, although it works similarly often, there's also this important element and I, Glenn Greenwald of course had to work a lot with this when he was working with uh, 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 with Snowden and so on which is that you have to protect your sources so you're not required to divulge to to tell people who you got information from now while for somebody like Snowden and so on this is really important so that you can protect people's identities it works against us, the general public, because it obscures where something comes from. So the New York Times and the Washington Post, they could just say like, yeah, 
official X or source Y, and that can be a complete, total, utter fabrication. We have no way of, of proving it. Um, do you have any kind of um, sense of whether journalism is still, we should, this is a, an important principle, like, like keeping um, sources secret, or if this is something that, I mean, I don't work with that at all because of this, this um, un, un, unreliable element and try to only broadcast people and opinions who I can show where it's coming from. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, it's true. I think I think you definitely want to have uh, when when you can put put someone's name on something when they when they give you permission. I think in in DC the, there's way too many cases uh, that that anonymity is is abused all the time, uh, mainly to spread gossip by from powerful people. They did this all the time to Trump, uh, leaking classified information against him to try to hurt him. Usually coming from uh, those three letter agencies, the deep state, if you if you can call it that. Um, so that it's totally abused all the time, but then again, there's, there's so many cases where, where it's important. Um, Edward Stone obviously was not, uh, really an anonymous source. He, he, he put his name on, on everything that he did. Uh, and you know, Julian Assange too is, is another famous right. case who, uh, so I think it's a, a difficult question, but yeah, there's, I, I, I can definitely think of situations where, uh, you know, someone's life is, is at risk or they're going up against something really powerful where uh, they, they need that anonymity. And Seymour Hirsch, another veteran journalist who I, I respect a lot, uh, a lot of his biggest stories were, were based on anonymous sources. I mean, uh, when he released, I think it was two years ago, uh, that the Nord Stream bombing was uh, partially a U.S. job. That was that was based on anonymous sources. He granted them anonymity because they were government officials. And uh, looking back, it turns out that 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 was correct. That that what he said was was right. What he reported on was uh, accurate uh, because there's been many confirmations uh, since by from other magazines like the Danish magazine Politiken. They just interviewed the harbor master at the site of of the uh, explosion, who who claimed that there were U.S. Navy ships. In the in the premises at the time of of the Nord Stream bombing, so uh, I think I think they could be very useful. Right? No, no, they can. They can. Um, the question to me is, if we think about media from the perspective of the of the audience of the viewer, it's like um, my question is like, how do we empower audiences to make sense out of out of the world? Because a lot of the attacks from mainstream media are actually attacks on our ability to make sense of stuff, right? So what is your recommendation of how viewers, especially younger viewers, should consume media? Because I think it's wrong, for instance, not to consume the New York Times and Washington Post at all. It's actually important to look at that in order to understand what they want the world to be. Um, I yeah I, I completely agree with that. I mean, the Washington Post is basically the the spokesman for the national security state, especially writers like David Ignatius. There, uh, there there's many writers there who who just say exactly what they're told uh, by those three letter agencies, and that's very important to know what they're thinking. Uh, you know, anytime they're they're editorializing, and they do this all the time, just in in news articles. They they started this, I think, with Trump, uh, just really editorializing against him. Uh, they do this with any article on Russia, you know, the unprovoked uh, illegal invasion, aggression, can't stand. It's uh, a democracy versus autocracy. They basically talk in the same terms as as the U.S. State Department line on this, that this is uh, democracy versus autocracy or or just taking it from the NATO's website. Um, and, and this is how they deal with things. So I, I think it's very recognizable just when you when you hear the same things being repeated all the time by these outlets, uh, it, it's good to just, a little alarm should go off in the back of your head and say, wait, is that is that really true what they're saying? Because everyone's saying the same thing at, at once about uh, you know, Syria or, or Russia's motivations for invading Ukraine, that you just, you should be a little skeptical of it. Yeah, so if you, if you do a media comparison and you see the same adjectives repeated, time and again it might be an indication that there's that there's something going on that that needs further scrutiny um 
the, the, the fascinating thing then is also that one of the mechanisms is, of course, to call people names, right? It's like, it's that bad. Like Glenn Greenwald, like uh, Aaron Maté and, and Max Blumenthal and all of these great journalists in the US, they're being called Putin apologists and, and spreaders of fake news and, and disinformation. I mean, it's just slander, like common slander. And if, and sometimes... I remember that that case where um, Matt Taibbi was basically taken apart by um, by uh, um, what's his name. And, uh, he he went online on on I think it was CNN or CNBC uh, with um, ah, what's his name that that uh, Arab journalist. Mehdi Hassan. Mehdi Hassan. Thank you very much. Um, right. And Mehdi Hassan basically basically uh, uh, tried to tried to make him look. ridiculous with like a minute little detail but a minute little thingy that maybe uh, that that Matt Taibbi didn't even get wrong just 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 reported on a, in a way that that in the, from the twitter files that wasn't that wasn't to maybe Hassan's liking but this kind of 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 character assassinations um what are your thoughts on that I mean, yeah, when, whenever they do that, whenever they they do this with RFK Jr. all the time, we, we see it now, uh, they're trying to label him all sorts of things. And, and this is not just with foreign policy. That's the thing. It's it really has to do with with so many areas, including in our domestic politics, uh, whenever they don't like something or Tulsi Gabbard, who's up for uh, a DNI uh, position, very powerful role. Uh, in the intelligence community, they do not want her in because she has uh, dissident views on all of these topics. She does not want regime change in Syria. Uh, she is in favor of negotiations with Ukraine. She is not a hawk, um, which is basically uh, who's just been in power uh, for the past uh, four years under Joe Biden, the hawks. And uh, so whenever they, they start labeling people, oh, pro-Assad, pro-Putin, Uh, Putin apologist, uh, disinformation agent. Uh, they always do this, but they never provide the evidence for for what makes them that. You can you can call someone that, sure, but you, you have to show why. And there was a famous incident actually that just comes to mind. It, it was it was really embarrassing for her. Uh, someone who I think spreads a lot of disinformation, Barry Weiss. Uh, she's very popular. runs the free press, which is supposedly a uh, big independent media, although her positions are, are really indistinguishable from any any neocon or the weekly standard. Uh, so I'm, I'm not really sure where there's that much original about her. But uh, she went on Joe Rogan uh, like three years ago to call Tulsi Gabbard, the same person, a, 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 a Putin uh, or an Assad toady. And, and Joe Rogan asked, well, Well, what makes her that? And and her response is, oh, oh I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't remember. But I just heard somewhere that she's an Assad toady. And so these things, just people hear this stuff and they repeat it, but they don't really think about it. And it it's just that it, there's nothing really behind it. Um, so I think people are very skeptical of that when, when they hear those kind of uh, uh, attacks and, and that sort of slander. Or at least, at least in our circles, people get get um, uh, are, are are skeptical of that. But the fear is, of course, that uh, a large part of the population kind of goes along because at the end of the day, in order to maintain political power, you don't need to convince hundred percent of the population. You just need a good part behind you, right? A good part needs to be immobilized or just just be fine. So that the other 20, 30 percent who like kind of wave the flag and say, like, we need to change something actually don't don't get to do to implement these changes. And I think to a good degree, we can see that at the moment with with uh, Donald Trump. Right. Or the, the how how Donald Trump was able to rally together people who are really discontent with the way the United States runs and also like with a lot of the warmongering. But how one of the major uh, major ways of the system is trying to uh, make it impossible for him to implement the changes that that actually his electorate is demanding. It's it's very true. He has a mandate. He he has a mandate to, for instance, end the Ukraine war, yeah. and it is there. There is a large part of the Republican establishment that does not want him to do that.
uh, including people in his own cabinet. Like, you know, you know, Marco Rubio is is uh, one of those people who's been uh, cheering on uh, the, the Ukraine war this whole time, wanting us to send them the long range missiles, which Joe Biden uh, just just allowed uh, Ukraine to have, which is actually one just went off inside uh, Russia, you know, last week. And, and they retaliated uh, with a hypersonic missile in Ukraine. So things are getting very intense, uh, climbing the escalation ladder very quickly. Um, so there, there's definitely threats from within his administration. And that was that was the case last time around, too. And I'm not I'm not even in the prediction business. So I, I have no idea what's going to happen. I just hope uh, that, you know, that the, the more rational minds will will win out. But I, you know, I have no clue. Yeah, yeah, and it's we are we stand yet to see whether or not um, not only Trump is able to to um, come true on these promises of peace. I mean, he was the pro peace candidate, or he he is the the one who was was rallying on this on this on this promise. Um, we'll see if it if it if it's if it's going to materialize. I what mean, is your you know what, what, I... what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to an issue like Israel, for instance, which I think well, is yeah. uh, what's going on in Gaza is, you know, the, the supreme moral crime of, of the century. It was the Iraq war, but it's now what's going on in Gaza. I mean, uh, it is, as Gora Alan um, in 2004 called it, a huge concentration camp. And you can only imagine what it's like after October 7th, uh, the starvation and just the bombs that were dropping. We've really turned it into a parking lot, as promised. And so that's all been done uh, with by the Democratic Party, too. And Joe Biden, he owns that. Um, and so, you know, Trump is obviously as pro-Israel, fanatical uh, Zionist as as it gets, you could say. I mean, you know, I, I don't know what he really thinks, but at least by the, the people who he surrounded himself with, uh, they are all very, very uh, Zionist um, and, and radically so. Uh, wanting to now eliminate the term the West Bank. This is Tom Cotton's new proposal. Um, they, they've basically, uh, I mean, they, they have not formally annexed yet, uh, but they've, they're have they almost there. Um, and so I, I don't really see how things could get much worse. And I think a lot of voters felt the same. That's why in Michigan, uh, Trump uh, or Kamala Harris did, did not win those votes, did not win those Arab votes. Um, so I, I think people recognize that this genocide so far is, is the Democratic Party's genocide. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a horrible, it's an absolutely despicable situation to be in. Um, and uh, it makes me feel very, very hopeless, actually. But one of the things that gives me hope is to hear that, you know, people like you, 23 are working their way into actual media environment you know the place where where honest and and real reporting is needed so what's your strategy because on on this channel we are going to post a couple of your interviews that you are doing now you're doing them in a different style from from how i do them and I'm, i'll be very happy to share that uh with the others and what's what's your plans to build uh build your your own approach at at analyzing the world well, I'll definitely get into some more uh, written journalism. That's something I want to start doing uh, more of or, uh, soon. I, I did some of that uh, when I was working with Glenn, and I, I definitely want to get back into that. Uh, I've, I've been doing some interviews lately because, frankly, I'm only 23, and uh, I, I don't feel confident enough to talk about a lot of these topics. I, I have not spent the time that these academics like Ivan Kachanovsky, I mean, he spent 10 years researching this book on the Maidan Revolution and is, I think, the definitive scholar on it. And he's one of the few Ukrainian academics in the West who studies, uh, you know, the conflict in Ukraine. And so I, I defer to, to these people. That they're the people who I think nobody really talks to in corporate media. But obviously, they don't want to hear what Ivan Kachanovsky has to say about, uh, you know, the, the Azov Battalion and the neo-Nazis that were sending trucks full of weapons. No one on CNN wants to hear that. But, pe but people need to, to hear what Ivan Kachanovsky said. He's and thinks he, he spent the time with this issue. Um, so I think that that's, that's one of my goals is to talk to these people who are, are ignored or overlooked uh, and to, to really look at uh, our role abroad mainly, uh, but, but a, a bunch of different issues, uh, you know, 
uh, mainly mainly stuff that we looked at at system update, like civil liberties issues and just different uh, d domestic political issues as well. That's a good that's a good approach and i do hope you you will you will find your own format um pretty soon and successfully because it's it's very much needed and also a format you know uh, among among your own generation and even younger in order to to get good information out um so where should people go who want to follow you Well, they should definitely go to my uh, locals page. That's where I post all of my videos. Um, and I, I also post them on Rumble. So locals and Rumble are the same company. It's it's really the free speech alternative to YouTube. And and the reason that I'm I'm posting there is just because YouTube is, is famous for censorship, especially about topics uh, involving Israel, critical of the U.S. role in that war, and just generally what Israel has been doing to the Palestinians. Uh, there's There's been so much censorship in in the last uh year since october 7th on that topic uh and, and many other topics that i covered uh too like the u.s support for ukraine what sort of groups are funding there uh you know why uh putin invaded russia and Ukraine. and so or, or i'm sorry ukraine and and so i think uh rumble has just a, a better track record of respecting free speech uh, and, and heterodox ideas. Yeah. yeah, and the development of this entire ecosystem is going to be one of decentralization anyhow, so I think it's a good idea to to do that, go to different platforms and but and we will figure out um hopefully a way to still keep <laughs> keep our work together and organize ourselves as a network. I'm very happy to now have you in in my network and that we that we call collaborate. Everybody um check out um Harrison Berger, Harrison Berger, uh, for how to pronounce your name, Berger or Burger? Uh, burger, Burger, Burger. yeah. Okay, uh, so it's a ger German name as well. Um, okay, Harrison Ber uh, Burger uh, on locals and and on Rumble, and um, stay tuned for his for his great uh, interviews coming on to you also on this channel. Thank you, Harry. Pascal, thank you so much for having me.